Hello and welcome. I'm Tracy Polowich, host of the Excellence Connection podcast, where we connect our listeners with subject matter experts, knowledge and resources to help along the excellence journey and improve organizational performance. Today, my guest is Suresh Lula. Suresh is well known in the quality field and is often referred to as the quality guru of India. Welcome to the show, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. It's such an honor to have you join me on this podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Um, do you think that I could have you just give a little more of um, your background and tell our listeners some more about yourself? Okay. <clears throat> I did my basic engineering in India and worked in the U.S. for five years with an oil company, Sun Oil Company, and Schmidt's Brewery. That's where I got introduced to quality. Since I was young, they taught me to taste beer, and I started my quality interest from tasting beer. I came back to India in 1972 and um, worked with a management consulting firm called AF Ferguson and Company. They were the Indian affiliates of KPMG. I was restless. I, I needed something more specific. So in 1987, I formed a company called Kimpro Consultants. Kimpro Q, Impro is improvement, quality improvement, Kimpro. Kimpro Consultants, and we served as the Indian affiliate of the Duran Institute. Our clients over the years in India and Indian Ocean Rim have saved over $3 billion using structured quality improvement. Then I established the National Quality Award in 96. It's called the IMC Ramakrishna Bajaj National Quality Award for Performance Excellence. It's a clone of the Baldrige. At the Duran Institute, I'd been trained enough on excellence to have the confidence to launch it in India. It has completed 25 years now. Uh, in parallel, I established Kimbro Foundation for quality improvement in healthcare and quality improvement in education. Two very specific areas because no nation can grow if its healthcare and education systems are not good. So we have some recognitions going with it. And finally, in 2007, I was invited as director to the Global Benchmarking Network, founded by Dr. Robert Kemp. I'll pause now. <laughs> That's such an incredible background and, and so many different types of things that you've done, but, um, you know, the very purposeful um, efforts in the health and education, I, um, I think that's, that's amazing. So let's get into my questions. So you claim that a few chronic problems account for 80% of the cost of poor quality and that the cost of poor quality is at least one third of total costs. That is astonishing. Can you please explain that in a little more detail? Obviously you've done a lot of research on me and my blogs and articles to be so articulate about the question. 
Well, the iceberg is a most spectacular creation. But we only see 20% of it. 80% is below the sea. And this 80% had the power of even killing the Titanic. So we have icebergs of cost of poor quality in every organization. We tend to see just the tip and we do firefighting on that. We treat the symptom of the problem. You have a headache, take an aspirin. Headache reappears after three minutes, three hours. Take another aspirin. That's treating the symptom of the problem. One has to go to the root cause. That root cause only a doctor can find. And the doctor asks you to get tests done for X, Y, Z, and looks at the diagnosis and says, buddy, you have constipation. Treat your constipation. So now, <clears throat> coming to this, 20% of problems account for 80% of the COPQ in our organization. It's very clear if you walk a process, you'll realize this. We budget for these things and we therefore don't know them. For example, why do you have inventory to absorb the shocks of the previous station? Right? Yep. Now, to, at least in India, to compound the problem, banks give us loans against the inventory we hold. So it's perpetuating poor quality. What do you purchase? Whatever you purchase, you tend to look at bids and the lowest cost gets the order, at least in India. And what you're buying is an output from an incapable process of a supplier. That fail, that defective product, lowest cost, creates problems downstream. So what should you purchase? Process capability. First establish the capability of a process and then you won't have your problems. But we're blind to all this. Recruitment process, maintenance process. Why do you have an after sales service department? Because my product will fail in the field. Right? The Japanese don't do that. Their after sales service department is two persons for a global market. And here in India, we have 200 people for an Indian market. Are you getting the message? Definitely. So finding the vital few problems. One has to do a walk through the organization on all the processes, not just the value creation, but also the supplier and service process, support process. And you'll be amazed at why do we budget for all this? Why do we budget for absenteeism? 
Okay. I'll, I think that's a long answer for you. Yeah. And so, you know, you talk about the 2080, the Pareto principle, and that 20% of quality improvement projects account for 80% of reduction in cost of poor quality. That's kind of the other side of the equation. And so basically there you're saying that a business can invest in a few improvement efforts and reduce a majority of their waste. So can you like give us an example of kind of how that, how that happens? Okay. Um, my first major assignment in India was in the late 80s, 1989. Till then, I was struggling to get this concept of quality improvement. Everyone spoke of ISO 9000. They forgot that there's one chapter on quality improvement. Ignore that. So the chairman of Tata Steel, one of the darlings of the share market, he called me to his office and said, young lad, tell me what you have to offer. So I, I was overpowered by this huge guy's presence. Uh, I sheepishly asked him, uh, do you have any rejections in your uh, operations? He said, yeah, 3%. I said, oh. And he said, um, so what does it cost you? And he said, it doesn't cost me anything. There's such a pent up demand in the market, I can even sell my rejects. So we systematically went through what is cost of poor quality. I give him credit for having such an open mind. I introduced the concept of internal failures. Failures when you own the process. External failures, once the process migrates to a customer, customer's customer, and so on. And procurement. So external failure costs. Appraisal costs to keep things under check. And prevention costs, such as quality improvement, to give you results. So he said, okay, let's do a quick dipstick. And I asked him a few questions and he did off the cuff calculations and uh, concluded that 10% of his total costs are cost of work quality. I give him credit for agreeing to such a number. I wanted to say 20%, but I said 10% is good enough to get my feet in. He said, would you dare to share this information with my top management? So he set up a meeting at, uh, at the bungalow away from the plant in Bihar, Jamshedpur, etc. And it was French chalets and things like that. And I had the top brass as my audience. My knees were knocking. I, so I went about it slowly, slowly, slowly. And the body language started changing particularly of the finance head and the managing director. At the end of day one, the managing director said, 
if this is true, we should become the lowest cost steel producer in the world. Done. The finance director went home, did a lot of calculations, and the next morning whispered something in the chairman's ear. And the chairman marched up to my table where I was having my breakfast, and he had a sense of humor. He caught me by the collar. Say, you know nothing. My finance director tells me our cost of work quality is 35% of sales. Wow. Now, that started... Every division put their hand up. Let's do the pilot work in my division. And the chairman said, hang on. I have 65,000 people on the, at the plant. We need to create a culture of quality. You can't do sporadic, yes, the vital few projects. No, the, the pilot projects must benefit the worker. So what were the initial projects that were chronic problems? Hold your breath. Garbage not collected from the quarters. Leaking roofs in the quarters. These were the two pilot projects and who had to work on it? Upper management, because you walk your talk. People listen to what you say, they believe what you do. You want to create a culture if the top management is addressing these problems, then better align with the organization. I'll just take a little more. Riding piggyback on garbage not collected was absenteeism. People were falling ill. So you call a substitute worker who is not as skilled as the original in a factory and you get more variation and loss of productivity. That aside, but the art lies in seeing with your own eyes. So I took the top management to visit a worker who was absent. And this worker, it was noon time. He opened the door and looked the picture of health. Why are you absent? He said, my child is not well. Oh. What's wrong with your child? Oh, nothing much, a cough and a cold. And you're not at work? Sir, I go to the Tata hospital and I stand in line for my turn. Then the doctor sees me and I stand in another line for the medication. That takes three hours. What was the root cause of absenteeism? The processes at the hospital. And you wouldn't have known this had you not done an autopsy going and seeing it with your own eyes. The organization in its first project on absenteeism saved the equivalent of $800 million recurring. I had believers. Then it just rolled on and on and they became my star client. That's incredible. And, you know, just some simple things, once you start looking at them and dig deeper, you can find 
you know, issues that can be resolved fairly easily, right? Yes, and they have a multiplier effect. From one unit to another unit, everyone benefited from it. So you mentioned about the finance um, and a few of the other leaders in the organization. And what I wanted to ask you is why is it important for the quality and the finance and human resource functions to collaborate for quality improvement? What is the report card of a finance head? Profit and loss, right? Now, if I can bring health into that, just one moment. If I can bring health into that report card and it doesn't matter where it's coming from, if I can reduce costs, let's put a proposition to a finance person. You have sales of 100 million, 100 billion, 100 million, whatever. Your investment in that plant would be 200 million. Your profit would be 10 million, right? And we say your cost of poor quality is 30 million. Now we have a challenge. How would you like to double your profit without capital investment? Your logical option would have been double the plant across the road, construct one. It may take two years. I'd have to spend another 200 million. Whereas here I'm saying, you've got, and, and your profit was 10 million. All I'm saying is work on your vital few quality improvement projects and halve your cost of work quality and more than double your profit. When you speak this language and keep the word quality as muted as you can, the finance person takes it. And then when it comes to reviews, he's the person chasing, where is that money? Okay, so, Workers take a signal from what is being reviewed by top management. And they align. So the finance head has to be involved. And another person who should be involved is the head of HR. People make quality. Or people sometimes don't make quality. It's not that they intend to inject some failures into your process, but that's how they've been taught. They're all well-intentioned workers. Give dignity to them. Train them specifically on how to avoid problems and not be afraid to flag problems. In India, at least, in organizations you have, if you flag a problem, you're to blame. I don't know if it applies elsewhere, but the idea is drive out fear. Let the workers feel we're participating and some of these problems may really be a big problem leading to customer dissatisfaction. 
Uh, okay. So it's really about talking the language of the leaders of the organization in terms of profit and loss and and the costs and and you know inspiring them from that perspective and then also it's about the culture like when we're talking about people and involvement and you know not having that blaming sort of um culture in in the organization but having more involvement and working positively that those are the things that try to bring, bring people together those the finance and the quality and the hr yes it's harder in service industry than in manufacturing how so because in manufacturing the customer who defines quality who is the final inspector and who pays your salary that customer receives an output from the operation and weights it against competitors offerings and decides i'll vote for you or i won't vote for you in service the customer's part of the process you check in at a hotel with the moment of truth you go to the room there are several moments of truth there food is great everything's great check out process is bad one failure and everything is condemned and bad quality now the cost of work quality in service is 40% of total cost in manufacturing because they have this big inspection battalion coming and inspecting it's 35 maybe 33 in continuous process industries continuous raw oil fertilizer so on, it's lower it's about 18 to 20% because quality is built into the design you build quality you don't inspect quality okay now in service industry the healthcare area becomes even more critical because human life is at stake so all the risk analysis and all that goes and you have to be 100% sure that your processes work human life is at stake in education that customer stays with you for several years and the more you educate them the more demanding they get that's the toughest of the lot so in primary school secondary school college wherever the need stated unstated you know keep growing in an educational institution so uh i hope that answers your question yeah it's interesting and i think it maybe has a lot to do with the tangibility of the product versus the service is is that correct i'm sorry i didn't get it could you repeat well when you're working with product products and pr production and manufacturing that there's a tangible product whereas with service it's not yes. as tangible so that maybe leads to Absolutely. why there's a higher variance in quality and higher cost of yes. quality and let me give you a short st story 
I write quality fables. If you, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> Based on my experience, and um, I have hundred quality fables written and published. Now, one of them is God lost his reputation. Now, there was a cardiac surgeon who was revered as God. You know, he, he, he was the greatest surgeon, cardiac surgeon in the country. And he would do charitable work also. A lot of charitable work for the underprivileged. A family having a child, nine-year-old, with a cardiac problem in the villages made their way to Bombay and got this God to operate. And the surgeon, surgery was going on and everything, you know, we had fingers crossed, the power went off. And the standby gen set did not trigger in the five seconds it should have. It took nine seconds. The patient died. Now, just see the impact. God lost his reputation. Who paid a price for poor preventive maintenance practices? Okay. So when you're doing a risk analysis and estimating cost of work quality, you have to see the severity of the failure. And uh, I, I can't tell you, I know this doctor. And um, <laughs> it's heartbreaking. Definitely. And, you know, we, even though not every scenario would have those tragic outcomes it's it's um worthwhile treating our issues as if they would have if we want to really make a difference and and save costs of poor quality i'll give you another example of a multinational bank in south bombay in one of those Victorian buildings that the British had built, here was a multinational bank. I won't mention the name. And they had invited me to come and see what, how brilliant their operations were. Stepped in, marble flooring, piped music, Paintings of the best artists adorning the walls, you know, all over. It looked like an art gallery. And the head of the branch and I walked. And we came to one section, which may have been maybe 200 square feet. And in the four corners of that rectangle sat four pinstripe suit individuals working merrily on their personal computer. This was in personal computer years. So I asked the manager, what do they do? He said they prepare the monthly statements for the account holders. I said, oh, they produce, they manufacture uh, statements for the customer. He looked at me, quizzed. I said, let's spend some time with them. And uh, we spent half a day and concluded that you needed two persons to do it right 
the first time. And you needed two persons to correct the 0.5% failures. What was the cost of poor quality of that department? 50% of the cost of salaries, marble flooring, the paintings that were there, the personal computers. That set them rolling and uh, they did a lot of work with us thereafter, auto loans and so on. That's a service industry. Yes, good example. So another question I have is, um, how can business managers prioritize chronic problems based on cost of poor quality? See, <clears throat> quality is about customer and process. Don't make it any more complicated. The customer receives an output from your operations or your process. Now, could you repeat your specific question? I'm getting lost. Yeah, no, just about how can managers prioritize yeah, can the prioritize? chronic problems based yeah. on the cost of poor quality? So you have a customer. Now, when do we meet the customer? Only when there's a complaint, right? I'm now going to give you an example of an organization in Thailand, Thai Acrylic, an Indian-based organization there where I was consulting. And they were, uh, producing acrylic fiber, and I asked the head, the CEO, um, who's your customer? He said, it's my wholesaler who ships it to Europe. I said, no, who's your customer? He couldn't understand my question. I meant the user. So, I said, come, let's follow the track. Where is your acrylic fiber being used? We traveled Europe and we reached Sweden where that acrylic fiber was being used to make children's toys. And children use it biting, et cetera, tear it apart, et cetera. That changed his thinking on quality. He prioritized it. He said, the first priority has to be that all my top management must adopt customers. We must proactively understand their needs. They were able to satisfy that ultimate customer bypassing the wholesaler and the cost was much lower for them. There is no substitute for proactively meeting a customer or a potential customer. Your prioritization will happen there. You exist because you have a customer. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so to answer that question, it may not be specific. All I'm saying is the leaders must meet customers. I've done it with an insurance company where they've gone and met customers and the meetings they had thereafter completely transformed. They were talking about insurance issues faced by customers. 
external failures. We are blind to that. The minute that last transaction, it's gone to the wholesaler, our job is done. But the user is important. <laughs> right. Um, another question I have is around the sporadic and chronic problems and which type of those problems um, should organizations look at addressing first? Maybe we can also talk about what is a sporadic problem versus a chronic problem. Uh, first, kind of define those and then and then talk about how, how they should be addressed. See, the underlying response has to be problem solved. You have to solve a problem. Are you solving a sporadic problem or are you solving a chronic problem? In a sporadic problem, you have symptomatic evidence of a spike in some performance. Put the fire out. It's like a firefighting department. Put the fire out. What happens after the fire is out? Comes a fire prevention department that goes through the ashes and tries to identify why did a fire take place? A short circuit. Or in a hotel in Bombay, South Bombay, there was a fire, the engines came, put the fire out, and they rung their bells and went away. The next day, the fire prevention department came. And they realized that the sh shopping mall that was in the basement sold carpets, curtains, silks, which could catch fire very easily. Their drapes in the lobby were curtains of the best fabric. The flooring had carpeting. And it took a short circuit in the basement to create that fire. What were the remedial actions? Marble flooring. Glass instead of curtains, you know, very, uh, I, I don't know the terms, but they have beautiful glass. And in the basement, um, there's a check on what products are being sold. So sporadic problem is when you have a sporadic spike in a process, a fire. And a chronic problem is one which has been existing and you have not known it till now. The short circuit. In the case of the hospital, the gen said did not trigger. You know, you take it for granted, at least they do. <laughs> and uh, the emphasis has to be on preventive action as opposed to corrective action. All the ISOs and all talk about corrective action. There's one chapter on preventive action that nobody looks at. That makes the difference. JCI for healthcare has a chapter on continual quality improvement. Oh, we'll address that later. Education, at least the Indian system and NAC, they have a continuous improvement chapter which is completely ignored. They feel any problem solved is an improvement. 
It's not true. A problem that permanently brings in beneficial change. That is when you've addressed a chronic problem. They don't come with alarms. You have to look in your profit and loss and working capital accounts receivable. Why do you have accounts receivable? <laughs> Are you getting it? You've got to question every of them, every one of them. And oh, this is the way it happens here. And this is, you know, the justification is the bureaucratic processes that prevail. All one is asking is an innocent question. Why do you do it? No one is bothered. And not settling for this is how it's always been done. I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Well, and not settling for this is how it's always been done here, right? That's <laughs> always the answer to why is it yeah, done this it's way? It's always done this way. Right. Uh, you want another story on the chronic problem? Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Caterpillar. Um, manufacturer of earth moving equipment in the US has operations in South India. I emphasize South India. And uh, it's been running well in, uh, in collaboration with the Indian house. Till a new president was appointed, Ramesh Dada. Ramesh Daga was trained on quality improvement at Caterpillar in the US. So he came here and he was a qualitist and walked around the factory. He came to the canteen, workers canteen. It was a mess. The executives club, as it were, was above the canteen. And the staircase going up, below that were bins of garbage. So the polite visitors would put a handkerchief to their nose and go into the club. He said, this is totally unacceptable. What is the cost of poor quality of this waste? The direct cost, the local municipality doesn't carry as much garbage per customer. So we've got to rent a special van to collect that garbage. In those days, it was 10,000 rupees. 10,000 rupees multiplied by 360 days is a big number. So he said, okay, let's do some diagnosis. Let's segregate the garbage. Top management, the president is doing this. Avoidable waste and unavoidable waste. Fields, you know, uh, packing, etc. that's going on. Unavoidable waste sorry, avoidable waste, cooked food being thrown away. That's avoidable, particularly in a nation as India, which is very conscious of, you know, food and other issues. So he said, we have to continue this diagnosis. Let's go and see with our eyes and autopsy. And they went into the canteen and saw serpentine lines of workers waiting and filling the, what we call a thali. It's a large steel plate with as much food as possible and going, having a little and throwing the rest. 
So on inquiry, it was said that, sir, we get only half an hour lunch break. So we take whatever is being given to us. Two, we are South Indians and you're serving us a North Indian cuisine. There's a distinct difference between North Indian cooking and South Indian cooking. QED, problem solved. And how do you implement it? They invited the wives of the workers to supervise the cooking for South Indian food. Food quality improved and wastage vanished. Savings were made. To win the trust of workers, they plowed back that money into the canteen renovation, which started serving other club with table tennis, carom, uh, other pastimes. They went one step further. They had a painting competition, art competition of the children of the workers. And the 12 best were published in a calendar the following year. The remaining adorned the walls. Can, can you imagine what it did to the workers? Trust was good. So you can't just see improvement as a clinical process. You've got to see it in an excellence mode. And incremental improvement has to be a habit. If you look at the Baldrige criteria, the scoring guidance is a roadmap. The first layer tells you, do you have a system in place? Everyone's got a system, ISO, JCI, etc. The next layer asks you, do you have continual improvement? Incremental improvement, left brain, incremental improvement. So we see, some performances of scores going down. Then comes, do you benchmark the practices? And finally, it says, do you do disruptive improvements for innovative solutions, the right brain thinking? Now, when you, that's a very demystified way of looking at the scoring guidelines. Very beautiful guidelines. And uh, I think this example shows you that disruptive thinking can give you rewards. They don't have to be in profit and loss. But look at the loyalty of the workers thereafter, the commitment, getting a commitment from workers is a big thing. It definitely is a big thing. And um, just all your stories, Suresh, are so fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing all of them with me and the listeners today. As you mentioned when we were speaking earlier, um, you could write an encyclopedia about cost of poor quality. But I think that today you covered a lot of the key elements and um, I know that this information will be valuable to our listeners. I have one last question and that is, it's, um, it's gonna be odd to ask you because clearly you have established a very uh, strong growth mindset but how do you remain in that growth zone and um, deepen your own growth mindset? Uh, as a policy, I make friends with young people. And I learn a lot from them. So that's one part of it, to keep me energized. 
I also look at um, trends in the market. And for example, currently it's innovation, disruptive thinking, creative thinking. I use the tools taught by Bob King from Gold QPC in New Hampshire. We represent them also. They are so simple, but they bring the child out in you. Uh, time permits, I'll give you an example later, if time permits. And uh, I'm looking at the environment and Mother Earth as the final customer. The prerequisite for an external customer is internal customer satisfaction. The prerequisite for internal customer satisfaction is community satisfaction. You know, we have, India is full of many communities. The prerequisite for that is Mother Earth. And today we can see what Mother Earth is doing. She's angry finally, she's had a belly full. So you can't talk of quality without seeing the environmental impact. The air, the water, simple things. So true. And, and the soil. What are we doing to the soil? So, how do I remain in that zone? zone? Uh, how old do you think I am? I'm not sure. How old? I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm approaching 80. So you have a lot and, of experience and a lot of growth has happened. Yeah, I'm, uh, I remain energized by being friendly with young people. If I go with my own age group, I feel I'm in an old age home. <laughs> <laughs> and not that that's, I, I don't mean to uh, being negatively about old age homes, but my own personal reaction is, oh, that's not for me. And I'd rather have a conversation with a younger person. And young people have such aspirations and good ideas. So it tickles your creative mind also. And the trick is, Keep the mind occupied. Yeah. So current thing is Mother Earth. And I'm talking to many evangelists around as to what can we do, quality and that. So I've coined a term green quality and green excellence. And uh, I'm working on that. In fact, I'll be going into a meeting from here to a Green Excellence meeting. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Suresh. I really appreciate you um, joining me today. And I hope that maybe we can bring you back and, and talk about green quality and, and some of the other um, interesting things that you have going on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll talk again soon. Take care. Thank you, Tracy. It was a pleasure being with you and very relaxed approach to having a conversation. Thank you. You're very adept at that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Right. Okay, bye-bye.
Bye-bye.